there's a, if you're near the boiler and that's just going like crazy, that's where I have my first cello lessons, right in the, right next to the boiler. <laughs> and when you have, oh, you know, all these confounding elements that are physical, or if there's something with a student that uh, it is a challenge for them, sometimes this validity could be a family situation. A lot of times with our programs, we're dealing with students with from varied backgrounds. We can have a lot of these uh, challenges to validity that we don't even see. And so you have to keep that in mind when you're applying a test, and maybe sometimes you have to do a follow-up test because you didn't get a true, uh, true measurement of their ability because of some sort of uh, validity issue. Um, norm reference testing, uh, you know, when you, uh, so criterion reference and norm reference. Criterion reference is similar to what you see on uh, pages two, three, and four. So the Miami Music Project uh, scale and the additive and cumulative scales on the second page. Those are criterion reference. They are, you are just really looking to highlight the differences or you're trying to uh, measure the skills embedded in that measure, in that scale by itself. Norm reference is you are applying the, the results to a normalized distribution of scores from a large population. So if you have, which is similar to the front page, the FIU scale, where you are looking uh, based on different aspects, you have uh, you you are applying these this gain knowledge to uh, knowledge that has been measured elsewhere. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide because then we'll talk about distribution, population distribution, and the bell curve, the mm -hmm. normal distribution. Uh, if you've ever taken a stats class, you've seen this over and over, right? This is what uh, every result of a, of a uh, uh, from a test, if it's really well made, it should the results should make a shape like this, where you have a mean in the middle, and you have half of them uh, lower than that, and the other half higher than that. Um, then what you can do once you have the mean or the average. Then you can determine the standard deviation. What the standard deviation is, is that it's a specific um, ratio of the students, a specific per, uh, percentage of the, of the raw score data points of the students on either side of the mean. So what you can do, or so we'll talk about what you can do with that. If you can see it's really small here, is those standard deviations, you have the first standard deviation, plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, plus three, minus three, and that's really where it normally stops. They went all the way to four, but that's basically zero. If you have a standard deviation of four, you're either all the way, uh, all the way positive, you got fives on everything, or you got ones on everything, if you're in the negative. Um, what you can see down here is the mention of z-scores. What a z-score is, is a standardized score. So it's taking the standard deviations and giving you a point value. Rather than taking the, uh, the raw score, similar to what I was talking about before with getting 100% or an A, is that that is based on just some percentage. What you are doing with standardized scores is you're really seeing how they how they uh, compare to a larger population or a sample. With a z-score, you have to compare it to a larger population because it's a fairly simple calculation. With a t-score, which is not indicated on there, and one that you would use most often, you can use a much smaller sample um, and get similar results. It's going to look the same. It's going to be negative, point, uh, negative 2.93 or positive uh, 1.79, whatever your standardized score is, and that what that score is telling you how far away it is from the mean, and also how many others were kind of in that same vicinity, right? Um, then you can start to compare between cases. Go on to the next slide, yeah. So then document, documentation and reporting. Oops, no problem. 
documentation and reporting. Excel spreadsheets are your best tool. They give you everything. You can calculate your means and standard deviations, and you can take the results from that, throw it into a T-score calculator, and there you have a full set of your, your scores ready to go. And those are all free resources. The, the score, the T-score, the standardized score calculators are free resources online. Um, you can also use Google Sheets. Uh, sometimes buying into an Excel spreadsheet or Excel, uh, the Microsoft Suite is out of the out of the realm for some programs. Google Sheets are totally free. It uh, is uh, it is a use it is almost as useful. It has a lot of the same functionality, but the it it works a little bit differently. So there are some considerations there. And then external providers might give you some tool like Children's Trust. They, get, they have this program called Samus. And basically it looks like a, a form that you just fill in the, the, data, the data fields. And then you have no control over that. So I suggest that you have your own backup in Excel or uh, Google Sheets. And then for reporting, these are useful for external uh, and future partnerships. And I want to open up now because while I could talk about a lot about that, I want to see what kind of questions are, and Anya and I are happy to field anything that you have specifically about the, the next steps. Once you have that data, what do you do with it? Um, or just any questions. So, yes? How much of your um, so the that time is So, the performance assessment that you have on the second two pages uh, happens four times through the year. Um, generally, we do that when they have a sectionals day. So those assessments happen um, in real time. Uh, so they're happening usually over, the assessment period is usually about two weeks, and they have one sectional time a day, uh, time a week, so for two hours. So about four hours for each uh, assessment. But as far as, yeah, as far as staff, uh, so this happens during the actual teaching time, mm -hmm. so teaching artists don't do anything extra, uh, but we do have um, people on our staff that obviously contribute, um, you know, outside of that helping out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially for the data management aspect of it. Right. You don't want the TAs to <laughs> Yes? Do you share and discuss the assessment results with the children, and if so, how do you do Sure. Uh, I don't. I would say not the raw data because that generally can be misconstrued, um, and they will apply it to that uh, that concept of I got a sixty five percent. That means I'm almost failing because that. But that's really where I want them to be. Like sixty five percent for a raw score is actually fantastic. It means they're a little bit above the mean, right? So they're in that first or second positive standard deviation, which is great. Um, so raw scores, no, but aspects from that, using a tool that has specific descriptions, you can tell them, you know what, we got to work on your intonation when you sight read. So let's think about audiating and singing it beforehand during that time so that you think about what it's going to sound like so that your F sharps don't come out as F naturals. And then also, um, you know, the, the music testing mostly also is we use for them to advance to the next levels and advance to the orchestra. So that's when the family gets to know that they advanced, you know, they passed. Uh, we might not share the actual numbers, but we'll say, hey, you passed in the next level. Or you need to work on this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rob, you mentioned that after two times you'll have a lot of age nine. Sure. Do you have, uh, can you find those data or that information online somewhere? Sure. Uh, if you look up, um, so the music aptitude profile, um, and also then the PMMA, the primary measures of music right. aptitude, those, it, and look up research surrounding that, there's all kinds of white papers that are out there that, about, that talk about the validation. Um, and the, the and specifically looking into that stabilization um, phenomenon. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with parent surveys, how do you ensure that you're getting high response rates? <laughs> so uh, actually, when Project Treble was going on for those three years, the, in, included in the research grant that they obtained to do this, they had incentives built in. So parents were actually getting gift cards to a, a local grocery store for filling that out. Um, at this point, the, the first page that you actually see in your handout, 
Uh, so after we completed the project with Trebel, we developed such a good relationship with the researchers that they are actually now almost part of our entire family and they, we continue work together. So the first page that you see is actually a parental survey that we didn't come up with, this, the, the researchers came up with, with it based on who we are for us. So it was very helpful. Um, but we, you know, the way we usually do them, we do them during parent meetings where they have to show up. So like if we do beginning of the school year parent meetings where they get all the paperwork signed, all the forms, kids choose the instrument, we get them right there. And then we also do it during the concerts where we know they're gonna show up. It is a challenge though, yeah. Yes. Um, as far as being kind of a smaller organization or someone who doesn't have a lot of human resources to do things like this, what are maybe the top three or four metrics or things that have helped you guys determine how you're gonna grow and share your vulnerability about what you Um to me when I hear this question, I'm always making fundraising because you know we have to think about, so I'm always thinking, what is it that the funder wants to hear, or what do they usually ask you? I found over and over that the number one question is, which I don't love that question, I'll tell you why. The number one question is, do their scores in school, their grades go up? And I always try to turn it to, are the skills that they need to use for the grades to go up, being, are those skills being developed? So I actually have a lot of conversations where funders about that, but, but I would do it from what are people that, I count on to give me money are asking me and I would focus on that. So if they want to know about a behavior, focus on that. If they want to know about musical excellence and musical uh, you know, uh, skill development, focus on that. But I would look at it from the fundraising perspective because that's what you need to do to run your program. But what if they want to know math scores? Like, if they want to know math scores, to send them to public schools to make that up. <laughs> well, you know, but we also look at that. So we do actually, you've seen the survey, we do get their data on, on, uh, on scores and stuff. So then you can, you can collect that data and you can look if that's improving. But, you know, there's a lot of conversation about is that actually because they're playing an instrument and how long does it take for them to, to play, to show up in the math score. So I, at this point, take an opportunity to have conversations with funders the same way I have it about the overhead, which I'm not going to go into. But the whole conversation of overhead costs, I'm going to pay for overhead. Okay, well, then let me go home and do nothing. Um, so, you know, I, I would urge you to have these conversations, and I found that funders who are deeply concerned about these things, they do listen. They do listen. Sorry. Can I say, just really quick, we'll just ask the question, and then we have lunch for an hour, and we really try to keep that as an hour so that you can ask more of these questions of these folks. So, question so let's do that, and then uh, we'll break a bit. Uh, you guys are in year 11 now. What year would you say you have what you would consider a robust evaluation program? Uh, we started looking at it very seriously when, when the FI researchers came to us and said, can we do this with you? That's when we kind of said, okay. And what year? That was uh, now five years ago. So it was in our year five, I guess, of programming. However, we always had some kind of, so you know, as you grow, you have some level of something. So I would say if you are a small program, I would never have an approach of, I'm too small, I should not or cannot do this. You can always do something. So find that thing and just figure out how you're gonna do it, commit to it. And don't commit to too much. Like I know board members sometimes they want you to do everything, you know. Um, but so have these conversations. But but don't have an approach of I'm too small, I cannot do this. You can always do something. So thank you so much for. Uh, if you want to contact, it was there. there. Uh, my email is Robert at Miami Music Project org. Anya's is. Anya at MiamiMusicProject.org, really, really nice and easy. So please feel free to reach out or let's have a conversation during lunch. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.